Before we debunk Webb's nonsense regarding Zappitz covering the Apollo samples, there is one definite mistake in Exhibit D, which I would like to take this opportunity to correct. In Exhibit D, I picked up on this section from the Space.com article, 30 years later, Moon Rocks retain their secrets. About 40 or 50 scientists around the world are still investigating the Moon Rocks. They have to apply to the curators at the Johnson Space Center with a detailed explanation on how they plan to use the samples and what they hope to learn. This led me to believe that only 50 geologists have ever looked at the Apollo samples. Some have written to say that this article says 40 or 50 geologists are still investigating the Apollo samples. That the total number of geologists studying these rocks has been downsized to 50 since the investigation began in 1969. Admittedly, this was a bit of an oversight on my part, and an embarrassing one at that. Years prior to the production of Exhibit D, I purchased a collection of old NASA movies on DVD. Among them was the 1983 film, NASA the 25th Year. In that film, we are told that over a hundred geologists were assigned to analysing the rocks when they first arrived. Meanwhile, more than 100 scientists from here and abroad began intensive studies of the lunar samples. I honestly don't really use these old NASA documentaries for much more than stock footage, and this segment slipped my mind during the writing of Exhibit D. I must also admit that I was a little hasty with the Apollo 11 press kit. I only used it to look up Apollo's radio frequency. Later on in the same document is a list of the principal investigators and their co-investigators who were assigned the task of being the first to analyse the samples. The total number adds up to well over 150. Unlike some propagandists I could mention, I can admit when I've made an error. But Weber jumps on this and tries to allege that I intentionally perpetrated a fallacy of proportion. Saying that only 40 or 50 scientists have ever looked at NASA's moon rocks, while knowing that the number is probably well over a thousand, Jerry has perpetrated yet another fallacy of proportion. Was it not Phil Plate who told his peers to never attribute to malice what you can attribute to a mistake? Yet this is something his fellow propagandists, such as Webb, very rarely do. Webb gets as much mileage as he can out of my one little mistake, alleging that I must think that geologists have lied about their 40 years worth of research, or that none of them really looked at these rocks. The bottom line really is, regardless of whether it was only 50 or 50,000 geologists who looked at these rocks, it would have no bearing on the subsequent results that we have to work with. It is ironic that Webb can accuse me of claiming that they are all liars when he routinely downplays their research, like claiming lunar spherules contain substantially less water than their terrestrial cousins, all the while knowing full well that Alberto Sol estimated that they contain as much water as their terrestrial cousins. And quite frankly, for a guy who seems quite hurt by my underestimated number of geologists and my alleged accusation that they are all liars, Webb certainly seems very shady with these geologists. Other than narrowing down the original number of geologists to 142, there are some things in this video that I feel need to be commented on. Between the time codes of 207 and 300, Webb scrolls through a long, long list of people who have investigated these samples. If Jerry is correct, and only 40 or 50 scientists have ever looked at NASA's moon rocks over the past 40 years, then I suppose Von Braun was lying when he wrote in this popular science article that 142 investigators were busy studying the first moon samples brought back by the Apollo 11 astronauts, and were preparing reports for the first lunar science conference in January 1970. And the 379 independent scientists and research labs listed here who authored or co-authored 139 different papers between 1970 and 1975 alone must have lied about all the testing they performed on those moon rocks. I suppose Jarrah thinks that none of them really investigated the mineralogy, chemistry, and petrology of these rocks. None of them compared these rocks to earth rocks, noting the similarities and differences. No one really marveled at the unusual combinations of rare earth elements in the creep rocks, 
or identified minerals, such as armalkalite, not known to exist on Earth at the time. None of them did any radiometric testing and discovered that all NASA's moon rocks were as old as, or older than, the oldest Earth rocks known to exist at the time, and that they had cosmic ray exposure ages as old as ancient meteorites, known to originate from deep space. Between 1970 and 1975, eh? That's interesting, because absent in this list are Sherman and Hefner, who during the Third Lunar Science Conference in 1972 reported that the plagioclases of Apollo samples contained ferric iron in almost the exact same proportions to still water and orthocytes that were heated in vacuum chambers for two days. And yet, Webb claims that ferric iron is totally absent in these rocks. If these rocks had been exposed to the Earth's atmosphere, all that iron would have turned to rust, or ferric oxide, which is also completely absent in NASA's moon rocks. Tell me, Webb, why are Sherman and Hefner not included in your list of scientists to analyze rock between 1970 and 1975? Also absent are the names Gay, Bancroft, Baun, Ramdor, El Gorzi, Jedwab, Herboschk, Wallasht, Neesons, and Van Gingbeers who in 1970 found the magnetite, hematite, mica, amphiboles, and sulfide minerals that Webb claims are non-existent in NASA's moon rocks. And he totally ignores O'Keefe, who analyzed Apollo 12 and 14 samples, discovered their similarities to tektites, and came to the conclusion that tektites are of lunar origin. I wonder why these names were left out. Could it be perhaps he didn't do his homework? Or was he afraid that someone might do a Google search on these names and learn something he doesn't want you to know? Meanwhile, looking up the names that Webb did include on this list, we find the names Mason and Melson, the authors of the Lunar Rocks, who noted the striking similarities in mineralogy and chemistry between Apollo samples, terrestrial basalts, eucrites, and howardites. Remember, Mason is one of two mineralogists who originally identified Elephant Moraine 87521 as a Eucrite before it was declared a lunar meteorite. Yet Webb claims that all ordinary meteorites in general are vastly different to the Apollo samples. The fact that the mineralogy, chemical composition, and oxygen isotope ratios of meteorites are different than the moon rocks, and chipping away the fusion crust doesn't magically make them the same. Also included on the list is Agrel, Schoon, Muir, and Long, who, together with Mackel and Packett, established that the Apollo 11 rock samples generally have water contents between 0.1 to 0.15% by weight. This is more than 10 times the amount that Webb claims is in the Apollo samples. He claimed the rocks contained less than 0.01% water. The trace water detected in the lunar basalts when they first arrived on Earth amounts to less than one hundredth of a percent by weight, compared to two tenths to one percent by weight for their terrestrial cousins. Another big quantitative difference. And of course, he included Friedman, Gleason and Hardcastle. You know, the ones who released a fascinating report that stated that lunar breccias contain water within the same proportions as freshly erupted terrestrial basalts, and that this water was not introduced through contamination, Friedman, Gleason, and Hardcastle presented one of the first reports discussing the presence of water in lunar materials at the Apollo 11 Lunar Science Conference in January 1970. And the report was subsequently published in February 1970. Would these be the same Friedman, Gleason, and Hardcastle who reported that lunar rocks contain hydrous minerals? Yet Webb claims they contain no hydrous minerals and that there is a big quantitative difference between water in Earth rocks and water in the Apollo samples. Webb also claims that this water was introduced through terrestrial contamination, and this contamination-induced water was detected remotely on the lunar surface. Okay. Since those rocks contain no mica, clay minerals, or hydrous iron oxides, minerals that would be present if water had actually played a part in their formation, it was assumed that the trace water was contamination that had leaked into the containers used to house the moon rocks during their long trip from the moon to Houston. And the same trace amounts of water were confirmed remotely on the lunar surface by the Cassini, Chandrayaan-1, and Deep Impact spacecraft. <laughs> 
Many chondrites found on Earth also contain significant amounts of water and hydrous minerals due to their exposure to Earth's environment. Minerals not found in any moon rocks. <gasps> and what's this? A.L. Turkovich? The same A.L. Turkovich who noted that Earth rocks and moon rocks and also Eucrites have the exact same elements in almost the exact same proportions? And yet Webb claims that Earth rocks and moon rocks have the same elements in far different proportions. They are composed of many of the same elements, but in far different proportions. And although they share identical elements with Earth rocks, NASA's moon rocks have different proportions of those elements, making the two groups of rocks as identical as Fred and Ethel Mertz. Did Webb even bother to check the research of these individuals? Or did he just pull their names out of the air and call it a day? Webb is either a poor researcher or a bad liar. If he lists all these individuals by name and praises their honesty, Webb must therefore have complete trust in their authority on lunar geology, including the things they say about lunar rocks that contradict his own claims. Otherwise, we can only conclude that Phil Webb is guilty of quote mining, cherry picking, and misrepresentation. And the NASA curate must be lying about sending out 400 samples each year to scientists and educators all over the world. All you have to do is take a simple training class on how to handle moon rocks. Once you're certified, you just make out a request and voila, you get your moon rocks. That is, if you're a scientist or educator. It's not that difficult for an ordinary geologist to get their hands on a genuine moon rock. All they need is a reason to study it. Getting an Apollo sample is not as simple as Webb makes it out to be, even if you are a geologist. Even though Webb shows us the curator's website for about a few seconds, he avoids mention of the criteria that NASA gives out for anyone who wants a sample. If we follow Webb's cookie crumb trail to NASA's checklist for requesters of lunar samples for research, we see just how many strings are attached to samples that NASA loans you. That's right, loans. The scientists only get to keep the sample if the sample gets destroyed in the process. And even then, NASA has rules. You'd think that all that would matter is if you chucked it in the bin. But no, you must go through NASA's procedures as to how you may destroy the sample. All this is just a brief summary. There's a much longer document titled, Lunar Sample Allocation Guidebook. The list of rules and regulations for how a scientist can go about studying a sample, who will be studying it, and so forth, is so long that it makes one feel as though you are on a leash. A geologist can evidently not even poke a sample without prior authorization by NASA. And absolutely every minute procedure that a geologist goes about in his or her study must be reported to NASA. In fact, a simple reason to study the moon rock is not good enough. You must first demonstrate a favourable peer review of how you propose to study the samples. Reading out this entire list of requirements would be impractical, as you could easily wrap it around your entire house. But I'll put a link in the sidebar for anyone who's interested. My congratulations go out to the hundreds of geologists who were able to pull teeth to get the samples. I just wish you had not been so trusting of NASA. Maybe then, you all might have put two and two together. We'll give Webb kudos for pointing out that the total number of geologists is indeed higher than 50. But because Webb evidently does not have faith in these geologists, as is evident by his omission of certain geologists who contradict his claims, or his ignoring of the research of those he includes, not to mention his downplaying on just what efforts one needs to go about in order to get the samples, I call this yet another complete failure in Webb's lame critique series.